everyone. Today we're going to be discussing a very hot topic that's actually been on my mind for quite some time. Um, as a collaborative divorce professional, I always try and support clients in staying out of court and resolving their issues out of court. Um, and we all know that mediation is cheaper, faster, and less virtual than litigation. Uh, but there is the question of whether it's always an option. Um, and that's something that I've been really pondering. And so um, in this podcast, I wanted to discuss this exact topic, um, in particular, whether mediation is really an option in cases of domestic abuse. So this is of this episode, just to be clear and simple, we will be using the terms abuser and victim. I do know that there's a lot of people who like the term survivor better than victim, but we will keep it simple and stick to those terms. Uh, so to discuss this controversial topic today, I've invited two incredibly knowledgeable professionals, and they will each be sharing their own perspective on this debate. Anne de Montarlo is a psychotherapist, and Ian Lovett is the head of mediation at Mediation UK. Anne offers psychotherapy for both couples and individual adults, and she's got extensive experience exploring subjects such as trauma and interrelational conflict. Ian is an accredited family mediator and one of the most experienced mediators in the UK, having worked on over a thousand mediation cases to date. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. Thank you. Happy Great to, to have you. So should we dive right in? <laughs> yep. So I, let's talk about the subject at hand. I'd love to hear each of your views on whether amicable divorce, you know, through negotiation out of court is possible when there is an imbalance of power. Uh, maybe we can start with Anne. Do you want to give us your view? Um, yes, I think it is. I'm, I'm very pro uh, mediation um, regarding that process. However, but I think Ian will explain a little bit what is the first uh, session, you know, the preamble to me mediation, um, because it it really depends on the outcome of that first session uh, that Ian has with his clients um, to assess the level of conflict. You know, I mean, you have reactive normal conflict. People are really um, very volatile in terms of separations. Then you have high conflict, and then you have toxic, uh, coerce, coercive relationship. Um, happening and depending on the outcome of that you would decide whether to pursue mediation or to go first see a therapist and get healed for trauma it would it depends what would be your view on this i'm sure it's a topic you've thought about a lot yeah and and from my perspective people will sometimes come into mediation having seen a therapist and having worked with a therapist over some time, some people will turn up at mediation knowing nothing at all. Um, and and therefore it's yeah. it's about what happens then. I think mediation, family mediation, and it might just be worth me mentioning, if you're if you're looking for family mediators, go to the Family Mediation Council website because there is a regulated process, but not all family mediators belong to that regulated process. It's not illegal. They can just trade as the family mediator. We don't we don't have a protected title like solicitor. Um, so if they come into mediation, there's a two stage process. The first stage is a MIAM, which is a mediation information and assessment meeting. And that's a one to one meeting with your family mediator. And what that mediator is going to be doing is going to be explaining what mediation is about how it works, what it's going to cost, the time scale it will take, and the process that we actually go through. And when you look at those words, MIAM, mediation information, so we're going to give you a lot of information and assessment meeting. So at the end of the meeting, both parties making an assessment. The client thinks, is this process that I think I can engage in? And the mediator looks at it and says, do, do I, the mediator, think this is right for this individual? The, the way that the FMC guidelines work is that we should do both MIAMs, so see both parties, before the mediator makes a call. But it's a voluntary process. So the, the client, the victim, in, the, in this case, if we're thinking the victim is going to be coming in, um, they can make a choice after that first meeting 
if they do not want to meet yeah. it. They do not have to. Um, in terms yeah. of the information that we give, um, we look at the alternative dispute resolution processes. So if you don't think that mediation is right for you, we will tell you what the other options are for you. So you go away with that information. We do screening. So if there has been domestic issues, we, we, we don't want you to relive the experience. That's really important. But we need to make mm. an assessment whether or not this is suitable for mediation. So we need you to give us certain information. If you can't talk about it because it is too traumatic, tell the mediator that. Mm. Yeah. Try yeah. not to be ashamed. And I know that's difficult, but try not, but but share it with the mediator. Um, because it's confidential and it will help them in their assessment. They can talk, the mediator can talk to you about the law, whether you're married, whether you're cohabiting, and, and how the law will affect you. Um, they will signpost you. Um, and one of those signposting actions is to therapy and to counselling. Um, cool. And we're there to answer any questions that, that, that you have. And we will try to do that. This is where you would yeah. advise people not to put mediation and any red flags that would lead you to telling them not to continue? I, th I think from my perspective, it's, it's about where the client is and, mm -hmm. and the, the particular, um, I, I, I don't want to use the wrong term, but if you, if, if you consider they're on a journey, it's being at the right point in that journey to engage mm -hmm. in, in, in mediation. Um, if they're anxious, if they're fearful, we have to ask a question as to whether or not they're going to get the best out of mediation, because it's a process of self-determination. Um, and um, if if they are um, if they're able to process um, the the information within a mediation setting, if they're able to engage, and uh, you know whether it's finances or whether it's child arrangements that they're looking at. They must be able to engage fully in that process to be able to make the decisions that they need to make. See Anne nodding along. What would be your, your stance on that? I mean, are there situations where it's actually safer to, to seek the protection of the court rather than going through mediation? Well, I think um, it really depends uh, bouncing back on Ian and that my um, session it's very important to assess if you can the the level of the mental space of the victim and sometimes it's it it can be tricky you know uh it certainly is tricky in my job as well because manipulation can happen if you're facing someone with a narcissist narcissistic personality disorder you know it it can be it can be tricky when there's shame, um, there are quite a, a number of silences, which can be a sign of problematic long-term abuse, uh, the fear of retaliation. So, yeah, as long as there is not something quite chronic, um, I think mediation is, is great. But it's when, when the mental space is not there, then for sure they have to go see therapy you know they have to seek therapy and and come back to mediation i mean it's it's, it's just one stop in the process for divorcing for co-parenting and then resume yeah. it, it's not antagonistic at all it, it, it works and you know works together right. but I, I think as a quote that also want to explore what the alternative is you know if they don't go to mediation what would that look like and, and, and usually it would be Court of law. And how would that unfold given the personalities at play? You know, if you've got a an ex who has narcissistic traits, they might actually thrive in that, you know, with that stage um, of, of a court of law. And so actually you might be um handing them, giving them a favor, doing them a favor by 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 going down the litigation route. So understanding what the alternatives would be, I think in the, these kind of situations, it's never going to be a pleasant experience. Um, it's just about finding the, the one that's going to lead you to the to the best results based on your own objectives. Yes, Ab absolutely. I mean, high conflict divorces that they thrive on on that. Absolutely. 
Mm -hmm. So, Ian, have you ever had um, the, these kind of situations where you've seen an abuser use certain tools or strategies to get their way and to kind of, you know, impose their own solutions? Yeah, I, I mean, we we see a lot of um, different behaviours within within the mediation. <laughs> um, I, I've come across people using bribery, using coercion. I've come across people mm. using put downs shaming embarrassing um mm -hmm. i've heard comments about the fact that the other party isn't able to manage that or isn't able to do this so you hear this a lot and i think one of the i think the fundamentally um if you look at the team that we've got here on this podcast we've got a coach we've got a, we've got a trauma therapist and, and you've got a mediator um for me a victim needs to make sure that they have a great team supporting them yeah. And, mm. and, and make sure that you've got that. Make sure you have someone that you can talk to. Make sure that you've got someone who can run something fast. Um, and and from a mediation perspective, if 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 a mediator hears something derogatory within the session, I would be expecting them to pick the party up. But I think mm. for me, one of the one of the safety nets that we use in mediation is something called shuttle mediation. So you, when when two parties are together, you either have shuttle or you have joint. Joint is you on the same screen at the same time. Shuttle, one of you will either be in a, you'll both be in breakout rooms or you'll be in a waiting room. The mediator will only have one of you on the screen at, at once. So they will shuttle between the two of you. That, mm. is a, that is a really nice safety net for the victim because at no point are they face-to-face -face with the abuser. Um, but also the mediator is going to be very mindful of the language they use between the two. So mm -hmm. they are likely mm -hmm. to use a lot of reframing. And they're mm -hmm. not going to. And, 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 and often what you will do is if you feel that there's a put down coming from the abuser, you will actually, I would actually say to the abuser, so what you're telling me is X. And I would reframe it to them before I then go to the other party. Um, so as they understand what you're what you're doing, what you're saying. Yeah. Right. And if you if you were working with the the victim in preparing for these meetings, how would you help them prepare psychologically? I mean, whether it's shuttle or not, there is still a, a, a contact more or less direct with with their abuser. Yeah, I I would um I would definitely help them identify their triggers because don't forget these people know each other's blueprints emotional blueprint quite well even though they weaponized it and use it coercively so really rehearse know your triggers your emotional triggers uh, because you don't want to react you want to respond and there's yeah. a big difference in, in in these two um you know you're going to be at the end and the receiving end of a lot of projection of a lot of aggression um so just be prepared uh you can you know with your therapist or your mediation or your mediator perhaps you know role play a bit use the wheel of emotions you know understand yourself better so you don't get caught into coming across as out of control because that's that's that is not good for yourself first and 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 and, and for the court and 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 it, it's not about being a robot and not being within your emotions, but you have to rehearse a little bit um, what emotions are involved, what script it is of relationship it is attached to. You know, the more you, you know a bit about your relational script, the better equipped you are to face things being thrown at you or provocation. Um, I would um, I would use also you know like we talked about what is your definition of what is success a win win looks like for you um, at that time at that stage like Ian said we meet the clients where they are on their journey and that's that's what it is and it has possibilities and constraints but yeah. that's that's our target and uh, yeah just just you know, uh, manage your expectations, as we say, mm -hmm. what it is you want to achieve, frame it, write it down, you know, stay in, in that in that box. 
And of course, throughout, use a lot of exercise of uh, self-compassion and mindfulness, you know, because a lot of uh, a lot of victims, and it's something you can do, you know, but that also has a therapeutic help, but it's something you can do on your own. It's, it's you know, a lot of victims suffer from, they need self-forgiveness and they need self-kindness because when they're really battered <laughs> and their emotional state and their mental state is not great, they think it's their fault because that's the whole thing about gaslighting and lying and 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 the abuse and the grip and the and the toxic violence. So in order to face a system, a mediation system or a court system, you need to self-forgive and to uh, self kind you know, use self kindness, compassion. Yeah. yeah. You know, and there's loads of stuff around there's Christy Neff, there's Tara Brack, it's online, it's free. Do it. It, yeah. it, it will prepare you. I think what you're saying resonates with me because certainly as a coach, I would very much focus on objectives. I think one of the of the keys is to think it and treat the mediation as a business meeting. Uh, so again, you know, there are emotions, they're hard to avoid, but mm -hmm. setting them aside and coming in with a clear objective, what, do, what does good look like for me at the exit of this meeting? And in a lot of cases, it's not, you know, seeming better than my ex, it's actually getting the outcomes I'm, I'm, I'm trying to obtain. Um, and trying to really get the person prepared on the factual side of things and approach the, the, the conversation through facts, through numbers, rather than through emotional emotions and, and moral judgment. And so preparing for that negotiation, you know, being clear on their red lines, being clear on things that they're actually quite open to negotiate, coming to the table with a proposal that is considered and, you know, thought through and reasonable. Um, all of that will help give the person a sense of control also that, you know, that, that they wouldn't necessarily have and really just stay focused on the objective of the meeting, which is to get an agreement that suits your needs. Um, and, and, and all the rest is, noise in the background uh so that so there's definitely a big piece around you know managing the emotions making sure that you're coming to the meeting in the right mindset but also that you're prepared with what you want to say you know definitely role play scripting all of that would be really helpful in making sure that you come to the to the table fully prepared and then and then the last thing i'd say is having a really good understanding of what the best and worst alternatives would be if to a negotiated solution. So if, if you did go to court, what would the best possible outcome be for you and what would the worst possible outcome be for you? Um, because I've seen a lot of cases where there is an imbalance in the in the relationship and one of the two will use um, a, a fake threat of, oh, you, if we go to court, you won't get this um, as the way being their way into what they want. And so being clear and speaking to your lawyer to understand what the alternative would be, it allows you to kind of be, to, to be clear about the range of, of agreements you're willing to, to settle on. Um, so, so Ian, one question that I've often wondered about is, you know, as a mediator, are you specifically trained on how to deal with these situations? And, you know, you mentioned shuttling, but are there other mechanisms that you can put in place to protect the victims and avoid any retaliation? Um, we, we have to be aware of our limitations um, because as a mediator, um, you know, just listening to the, to the support that each of you can provide, we are and cannot be on the side of either the victim or the abuser. We have to maintain our impartiality throughout. Yeah. Um, and, and that can be challenging um, mm -hmm. in cases of, of domestic abuse. And there might be with some mediators when they do that initial I am, they might actually feel so personally that they can't be impartial, that they can't mediate mm -hmm. this. And, and, and mm. that certainly has been the case in at least one that I can think of uh, that where, where I did the buy, I'm thinking that this, this will challenge me. And therefore I, I, I said, I said, no, um, I think that um, the sh shuttle is, 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 is the first thing. It, it's, it's actually trying to um, keep the two parties separate. So there is no facial um, contact. Um, there is then no 
um, you, you, you can't have someone who just runs their mouth off um, uh, because you've, you've separated them. And I think that's really important um, because yeah. if they're on the screen together, things can be out before you even know that it's out. So separating them is, 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 is key. I think the we, we have to go on courses. So as part of our continuous professional development, we have to go on uh, domestic abuse courses uh, and learn about things. But we are not experts. Yeah. You know, we, we manage finances, but we're not pensions experts. Um, mm -hmm. We have to attend uh, pensions courses and finance courses, to yeah. similarly with domestic abuse. Um, and I, I, I think that some of the in-depth understanding that Anne, you have talked to us about, that's why getting your team together is really important. Understanding the roles of each of those people, because you might come into, a, a client may come into a MIAM and I might look at that MIAM and think, you know what, I, th I think this is okay to mediate. Um, it might be Anne, that you have a much more in-depth understanding of the individual because you might have spent i spend one hour doing a miam you might have spent five or six hours going through the trauma that they've gone through and mm. it might be that the victim can open up to you in that five or six hours that they can't do to me in an hour and mm. and therefore listening to the guidance and the advice of the, of, of the team that are around them is really important and it's and it's not just Ooh, and it's about that it's about the, the victim feeling empowered and able to proceed and wanting to proceed. You're, you're so right, Ian. This idea of the team is actually vital for when we talk about victims because the victim has been cut off, as it were, from family, friends. And one of the huge things is to reconnect. So when you have a team, as you said, you have a system that works around you and that sort of illustrates on a bigger scale what you need to reconnect your life, you know, and, and you're being validated. So I think it's, it's a huge point, this, because it, it sort of illustrates what it is you need to do to get, you know, better. Mm -hmm. So hugely important. Solicitor is part of that team as well. Yeah, absolutely. The right one. Absolutely. As might be a financial advisor or, or, you know, depending on the situation, there's a, a whole array of professionals that they can pull in. Um, but it, it, I agree that having somebody who is there for you in your corner and and, and you mm -hmm. um, will be will be a very important boost for people's confidence and, and ability to face these situations. Is, is there anything else, Anne, that you would do to help people with any fear they might feel with confrontation with their, their ex, even if there's a shuttle? You know, there there might be a fear of retaliation for anything that they've said or or offered. Um, how would you help them deal with that and and prepare for that? Well, I would. It's it's tricky. It's complex. It's a complex question to answer yeah, it is. readily. But I what I would do, I would really focus on what it is they need to feel in control. What it is you need to feel in control and safe. And I would yeah. discuss that in depth because that's that's the key because you will have retaliation maybe maybe everything will be okay and you will have retaliation in five years time you know you you so it, it's to equip yourself with these two through these two angles you know yeah. uh, um, and be, and be prepared I don't know if you know there's this institute Gottman Institute in the states. Yeah. And they've yeah. studied capoeira for years and everything. And you yeah. know the four horsemen. The four horsemen, absolutely. You know the four, mm -hmm. the critics, contempt, counterattack, and uh, stonewalling. You know, yeah. if you prepare yourself to 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 that, you more you more equipped, and you it's like you you more equipped to fight because you're gonna have to fight, and you you have to you know. Uh, um, feel better within yourself and then know exactly the landscape so you can anticipate and be more in control because control has been taken away from you right and it's never your fault that's something i say all the time to victims just check that you cannot go you don't want to go you don't 
it's never your fault. Men or women, you know, men yeah. men are abused as well. So agreed. But I think that there's also a lot of really good applications and tools out there that allow to set boundaries. So that there's applications like My Family Wizard, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but it allows parents in the post-divorce or even during the divorce, it creates a platform for communication and everything is recorded on that platform and visible. And so it avoids also, you know, pleasant conversations that might happen through other forums. And you can, if you can limit the conversation to that platform, you then have a trace of everything that's being said, et cetera. So those, you know, they're not perfect. Somebody who really wants to, to abuse will find a way. It's a good way of setting those boundaries in the perimeter of the, the interaction. As is, as is doing the shuttle mediation, actually. <laughs> so one last question before we, we wrap up. I wanted to ask each of you in turn, uh, what would be your, your main tip to anybody who is a victim of domestic abuse and who's trying to get a divorce? What would you recommend they, they do as a, as a top tip? Maybe, Anne, do you want to go first? Okay, I think one of the top tips would be reconnect with people whether through um, another group of uh, victims or friends or because your, you know, your, your worldview has been somewhat distorted. So you need to trust yourself. Uh, yeah. So connect, 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 connect. Get a hobby. Get, the whole idea is to get a life outside of what you've experienced. Yeah, so, I love that. That makes a lot and, of sense. Yeah, that's, that's hugely important. And self compassion. That's my yeah. two main tips. Me too. Love that, Ian. What, what would yours be? I, I'm not so sure I can better those two, but my 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 top tip is 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 make sure you build that team that you have real trust mm. in, that you mm -hmm. accept the advice that the team are going to give you. I mean, the mediator won't give you advice, but you know your your coach, um, your therapist just make sure that you have got that team that can really support you because yeah. it, it's it's a long journey and you, yeah. you need to have people it's, around you yes. who you can rely on. I completely agree. I think, I think mine, I was thinking of what my tip would be, and I think it would be safety. Just, you know, safety first. Um, I think there's a lot of things that you can do at a digital level that people don't think of, just, you know, removing tracking on your, on your device, changing your passwords, those kind of things. Um, and there's actually a lot of professionals who specialize in domestic abuse who can help you through all of those dimensions, even things like having a doorbell that has a video so you know who's at your door. Um, and so so engaging yeah. with those people to understand what you can put in place to protect yourself, uh, because it's not just during the divorce, it's also afterwards that you want to make sure that you're mm -hmm. you're staying safe and, and your children, too, if, if you have children. Well, thank you both so much. This was such an interesting debate. I really enjoyed the conversation. I could have stayed here all day talking about this. Um, I really appreciate your time. So thank you both. Thank and, you. And uh, have a lovely you. day. Thank you for inviting us. You Pleasure. too. Bye. 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 Bye.